Welcome to Experience Focus Leaders. I am delighted to introduce you one of my muses in creating relate to, Oren Claff. Oren is one of the world's leading experts on sales and raising capital. His first book, Pitch Anything, is a bestseller of bestsellers and a part of American sales tradition at this point and has defined what he calls West Coast fundraising and West Coast finance. Oren, welcome to the pod. Excited to have you on. Hey, thank you, Alex. Appreciate the invitation and uh, Nate setting up the logistics. And here we are. Let's make something Let's make happen. it happen. Well, listen, sure. I think it's a, it's a, you know, not, it's a, it's a definition of impact when I was using you and your b- ideas of your book on how to connect really important ideas in a way that doesn't feel salesy, in a way that creates value for all parties, in a way that empowers people that don't want to sell. I was using it to build a digital product. And then I come join at some point an organization called Alchemist Accelerator in Silicon Valley. And you know, I thought I was very smart that I discovered your book and I was like, oh, this is like a competitive advantage that I'm giving to all our customers by incorporating your ideas. And then of course, guess what I hear? from from Ravi, who runs the program, is like, by the way, I recommend that everybody goes and reads the book, Pitch Anything, right? And then since then, you've wrote, you know, flip the script. So, Oren, tell us, you know, in a big idea way that you're expert at, introduce the audience to what's the big idea behind this and why they should drop everything and listen to the rest of this podcast. Yeah, for sure. So I think if you, if, As I started to learn the ways of pitch anything from a guy that I worked with, and I was seeing him close deals that made no sense to me. So he was saying things that I felt like if I said it in any transaction or sale or deal that I was in, everybody would just roll up their, you know, put their paper in the briefcase, say, thank you very much and leave. So, and we'll get back, but I I once saw him email to Everybody, lawyers, investors, partners in a deal we were doing, multi-million dollar deal, a email, all caps, three words in the subject line, lose my number in the middle of a deal, right? That we're trying to close for our benefit. And so I go, oh, deal's over. I guess, you know, Jonathan got mad, decided to let, you know, his darker angels prevail, emailed everybody, all caps, lose my number, this deal is dead. I am not going to make the $500,000 rip that I was expecting to make this month, right? And this was actually before Gmail. So we we're all using Microsoft Outlook. And I hear ding, ding, ding. I'm like, oh, here come the go after yourself. Deal's over, right? And the emails start rolling in and they go, so sorry, Jonathan. Sorry, I was taking so long. Um, we're wiring right now, signing the paperwork. Appreciate your patience. So how to lose my number on our side that we're the salespeople, mm. right? Not the guys with the money or the guys asking for the money. So how to lose my number, close that deal. And then I started thinking about some of the things Jonathan was doing. And he's doing everything opposite from what I would do to close a deal. So I'm like, I, I entered this like anti-gravity land. And then I started looking at it and I, and I started understanding that there's this entire social undercurrent in deals that is not obvious to the average bear of which I was the average bear. And, and so at the, on that day, when I started recognizing the things that he was doing, it was like, I went, reached into the back of my closet for a sweater, found like a little knob, you know, pulled on it, you know, I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, there's a door here. I opened the door, I'm like, there's Narnia back there, like flying dragons and spaceships and witches and war, like things magical things that I didn't even know existed. And so I started playing with them. And what I realized again is everything you see in a deal today, in a sale you're in, a deal you're in, a transaction. I've been in 250 equity transactions over the last 10 years, right? So the things you see day to day in the transactions are the surface level that don't matter. And there are things happening below the surface that really guide the behavior of the participants in the transaction. 
and what are those things? So I started peeling back the layer and understanding the things that actually, you know, the, 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 the Narnia level beneath the surface of a deal. And those are things, you know, that I wrote about in the book, intrigue, status, frame, frame control, time constraints. And those are the guiding elements in a deal you wouldn't be aware of unless somebody brought you into that world and showed you how they work. And what I love about what you're describing is the there has been a bunch of research on this, you know, coming from behavioral science world. There's been a bunch coming from neuroscience world. And it works in episodes, right? And it's oftentimes done by really smart academics. I love them. But very rarely have you seen actually somebody go and say, well, let's pull it all together in a very applied and practical and so, concrete way. Yeah for high stakes deals. And I think so that's what this, you've done, right? This is right. This is what I call like the coffee cup conundrum. So name your, you know, author of favorite, you know, this in social psychology, business psychology, you know, academia. So, you know, I've interviewed them on Cialdini, podcasts, I've been on right, podcasts yeah. with them. Cialdini, he's, you know, he may be better than your average. Give me, give me yeah. another couple names of sort of social psychology. Um, Near is one. Who else are you thinking of that, you know, books that might be on your bookshelf? The neuroscience of marketing was one yeah. that, that was not bad, so, actually, but it, but I think it no, wasn't applied. It was too, it wasn't well, yeah, high It's the coffee cup conundrum. Yeah. So what they do is they go, hey, look, we gave coffee cups to a bunch of college kids, right? Yeah. And on some yeah. of the cups, we had them write their own, their name, right? And draw a design. And then we bake that in a kiln. And other ones, we just gave them, you know, a regular coffee cups with designs on it. And then three weeks later, you know, we came back. And we tried to buy those coffee cups from the college students and the ones that ran their own name on and did their own design, you know, were very desirous of a high price, you know, and yeah. on average they were, you know, wanted five to seven dollars to sell that cup. And the, the students we just gave cups to had no affinity to them and they were willing to send them for less than a dollar. Right. Yeah. Hey, fucking wonderful. Except I walk into Goldman Sachs. Right. And I'm asking them for 40 million dollars you know, for an equity transaction in which I still don't have the side-by-side -side debt wrapped up. And I have to walk through the, you know, the downside protection, the narrative, you know, in that story, what the, you know, who the team is attached to, what is the valuation defense, you know, what are the, you know, what are the strike points of the price? What, you know, what, what is the cap table constructed of and why we believe this team can enter a high growth period. The fact that college students were willing to sell their own coffee cups you know, back for a higher price than the other college students is has no, at that moment in time, when I'm at sure. two Embarcadero yeah. on the 35th floor, trying to work with a managing director, 62 years old at Goldman Sachs, there is absolutely nothing in any of those books that I can use at that moment to drag that deal across the line. And that was the motivation for Pitch Anything, you know, which is like, what can I do tomorrow? With, with, you know, what, what, what methodology can I use to, today, this afternoon yeah. in a meeting, right, to drive the impact? So sometimes, you know, if you see back behind me, I, I can flip to this. Uh, you can see the wide, or if I can go wide cam. So you can see the studio here. There's a stage behind me. So we'll do, you know, I'll do presentations from that stage there. And we'll have people in the audience. You know, we'll go through a little bit of the pitch anything framework, and then they'll go to the conference room in the back. And they'll come back and they go, I just closed a deal that was stuck for the last three months. So we know this stuff works in real time as opposed to, you know, the, the coffee cups or, you know, these little like sort of college student games. And, and also these college student games work like I get it in Boston on, you know, on Harbor campus with yeah. college students. I am I am working with seasoned CFOs and CEOs who have negotiated billions of dollars, you know, out from vendors and, and investors and know the game of money, you know, as tightly as can be played. These aren't like naive college students who are stepping into, you know, discussion of capital markets for the first time in their lives. So anyway, I don't want to beat it to death, but yeah. But that, wait, what I just, if you don't mind, I double click what you've just done, right? Because it was a perfect illustration uh, in my head. And you tell me if I'm right or wrong of one of your frame control points of view, right? Like 99.99% of podcasts, there's nothing really of interest underneath the person, including even here, right? Like it was my own one. So I need to, I need to learn that. But for the audience that's listening, what you just did is you zoomed out into a huge stage 
where you're sitting, right? Which is yeah. um, your West Coast Finance Center experience. And there there's like, well, there you go. Oh, Let's see this. Welcome to the right. Matrix. Yes. Yeah, well, this is the Matrix. This is huge. There's like, you're a big car fan. So you're you're showcasing some of your hobbies in there, I could see. And so what it does is it says, look, this is serious production value experience. And this is not your average podcast guest, right? Like this is somebody that really knows the game. You have your lighting, your hair looks amazing. I don't know what hair products you're using, but whatever, you know, but you're like, but generally you're presenting like this sort of a higher frame of perceived value in milliseconds, right? Like, like people don't need to know anything about you. They go, oh, wow, this is serious. Am I right? So I think, I think that's right. I mean, this is, it's very important to say, so what the, the, what these are, are status pings or status symbols. Right. Right. And so a lot of times, exactly you say, like, I have a cool thing. So if you see that wall behind me, right, I can put a video to the, you know, if you look at this wall here, if I go podcast, blah, blah, blah. so I can throw some video to it. What's up there now? Oh, that looks like a Star Wars video. So, so sometimes I'll have this up, right? And I'll get on a call with private equity guys. I'll be talking to them for a few minutes and then they'll go, I'm, I'm sorry, what, what's that mural in the background? Right. And then I can't do it here. I didn't set up to do it, but I just push a button. Oh, hey, Nate, can you just go press the space bar? Yeah, just go press the space bar and uh, get that thing moving. So then this will happen. Nate will fly. And they'll go, what kind of green screen? There's somebody like walking through that. I'm like, hey, man, it's not a green screen. Right. Oh, it might not be loaded. Let's see. So anyway, so then, yeah. So, so then the Star Wars will start, will start playing. And they'll go, what in the world am I looking at? And then I'll go, oh, this. Right. And they go, wait, I don't even understand what I'm seeing here, right? right. And, and so I go, well, you're seeing the offices of West Coast Finance in a $2 million of equipment, you know, set up to only do one thing, which is to, um, you know, pitch deals, you know, to pitch finance deals. So this welcome to West Coast Finance. And so now I go, I know what you're used to, right? Guys opening their laptops in their kitchen, trying to pitch you, right. you know, a $3 million deal, right? Welcome to West Coast Finance. We're here today to talk about a $200 million financing of which, you know, $15 million has already been financed in the last 30 days. Are you guys ready to go? And so you, you don't need $2 million of equipment and a $10,000 facility to do that, right? But the, the, the gambit there is frame control and status. You can do status in your own way. You can do status from your kitchen with a laptop if that's your situation. But what you do have to do is status. And I'll give you a quick example. You know, hey, how do I... Or, hey, I don't have a $2 million studio. I'll just put my, my self-aggrandizing name up behind me. As so you can see there, you know, so then I'll throw my name up there and that. But, but if you're just sitting there, you know, in your kitchen with your laptop and that's what you have, right, which for many years, that's all I had. You know, I get on, I get on the funds with billion-dollar funds or even with billionaires running a family office, you know, and they've got this high-status frame, which is we have the money. We control the conversation. We say when it starts, when it stops, what happens next? That's their frame, right? Yep. And you, without unknowing pitch anything or being in you know the Narnia world, I mean, you walk into that and you go, you know, hey, billion dollar fund. Thank, thank you, you for so much. Thank you so much for taking busy schedule to fit us in. I know you guys have a busy, busy schedule. Yeah. Really appreciate you having time out of your day. You know, so so thank you. I got some really great slides to show you. I hope you really yeah. like them. Um, we're yeah. really excited to meet you guys. Can't believe we, you know, really have the opportunity. We've heard so much about you. You know, we just recently read, you know, this deal that you did and, and like you guys are involved in such great deals. It's just an honor, you know, to be able to get on a call with you and show you what we're doing. If you have any questions, feel free to stop me, uh, you know, along the way, fill in the blanks. Do you need any, do you need anything? Get some coffee? Are you ready to go? Do you need any more partners? Can you see, can you hear me? Okay. Is it, is it sound, you know, is the video good? So I'll, we'll hear this, right? And, and you don't have to do that. Right. You could just reframe the whole thing by going, Hey, Alex, good to meet you. Are you here for the 10 03 call? Because the 10 o'clock call started like a few minutes ago. All right. And you could say that to a billionaire. How do I know that? I've said it to 10, 12, 15 billionaires. I've said it to 100 uh, family offices. And what that is, you know, you don't want to say it rudely, but you can say it. And then you can smile, you know, Riley. And people understand you value time. Every businessman in America values time the same way. 
Nobody enjoys coming to meetings late. They know it does not impress anybody. It doesn't impress them. They don't like it when people come to meetings late. And you can just say, my value system and right. my status and my peer status is equal to yours. You can have a billion dollars, but this is America. We don't value people by how much money they have. We value them, at least over where we are, right, by their integrity, by their credibility, by their ability to live by their word, their, by their ability to do good work, and by their ability to be honest and forthright and timely. That in America is how we measure your value. Now, you don't have to say that. You can just say, hey, are you here for the 10 or 3 call? Because the 10 o'clock call started a while ago. Right. We covered a lot of stuff. Are you guys ready to go? And, and they will always apologize. Right. So right. that's one little thing you can do to pull your status back and say, I do not have to supplicate to people because of money. In America, that is not our value system, is that money makes the man or money makes the woman. Right. In America, right. what our value system is what makes them, and I think everywhere in the world, right? What makes the man is in or the woman is integrity, it is in keeping your word, it is family values. It is believe, you believe in community. It's in taking care of yourself. It is in you know, running a good company. It is you know, being able to work 30 or 40 hour work week and then put stuff aside and have a weekend with your family. Like those are things that make you a good person. So no matter how much money you have, right. it's very likely you have all those things and they can drive your status. And expertise, right? To some degree, we're talking expertise is also a valuable one, you would say, or what's your take on that? So, so for sure. The, what we find is that the status comes from one, taking yourself, at, you know, treating the counterparty as a peer and not yeah. supplicating to them. You know, yeah. not saying just because you have money, you get to order us around, right? Number two, status comes from saying, we have a deal of a high value that is, you know, and that we are of super choosy about who we're working with. And we're talking to a range of partners and looking for the right one. Yeah. Right. And we have a criteria. Oh, you know, we have criteria about choosing a partner, right? And we can share a little bit with the criteria. And then the last thing is the, the, the level of expertise that most people show on a call going through their deck, like most presenters or pitchers or people asking for mm -hmm. money right, is quite low, you know, right up to the end of the meeting. And they start getting comfortable at the meeting and showing that they're truly experts in their domain, right? We, you know, as, as people who give out money, who fund deals, right? We are looking for deep content experts, not yeah. strategy. Strategy is free. Strategy is simple. Strategy is theoretical. Theory is difficult. Application is difficult. How do I know that I'm talking to somebody who has deep application chops and then I want to hear about their strategic ideas. But everybody does it backwards, mm. right? And so I do big idea, which is strategy. You see, you see my decks. The big idea, I'm going to give you the big idea in two minutes. Yeah. Right? Then I'm going to demonstrate that I'm an expert in this space. And almost nobody does that. And so now, now you've got status, you've got expertise, and you've got the big idea wrapped up, right? And now somebody is interested in talking to a, you know, a true expert working on a big idea in the next generation of an industry. And now you have a pitch. So what I love about what you're describing, I'll translate it a little bit for like, for example, our audience that's more technical in, in like sure. in technology sales, right? So, you know, in our example that I learned from being early at Salesforce, Salesforce, you know, now it's all big name, right? But when we were just kind of pre-IPO there, we were really hunting for the big names that were recognized, whether it was a small business or a large business, we were very deliberate at getting that big name, even when we were actually, the core business was pretty small. And what happened is when we tell these stories, right, that would immediately raise the credibility. Oh my God, these guys are big. They're working, you know, with these very large respected organizations. Now everybody has logos. You could back it up with some more evidence behind it. So it's not just an empty logo, right? But it's, that's one simple way of doing social proof. Every startup in tech is, you know, trying to do G2 ratings or Gartner ratings of some kind right now. We like deliberately actually went after a going, going at 
that getting a lot of customer reviews, getting a lot of feedback to get those because it immediately says, hey, you ha- if you want to buy something in this area and we are a leader there, at a minimum, you got to take us seriously because we have third party evidence, not like us talking about ourselves, how great we are. That is that is ba- back there. So these are just some of the things we've been doing. We're kind of asking people to promote them. You could see them sometimes on the landing pages. The quality of the introduction matters. So it's like, hey, you know, do you have some time to help out my poor friend here who's fundraising versus, hey, you got to check this out. This is, these guys are killing it. They've got great brands. Maybe not even listing who the introducer or who the company is, like to create a sense of excitement and curiosity there. So do you see some other examples like that that you could even win the pitch before the pitch, so to speak? Because I think a lot of this comes before, right? You've written books. So people come to you. They're like, wow, you know, I'm going to get Oren, you know? <laughs> so listen, I think I think there's a couple ways to think about this. One is I have the perspective. You know, everybody wants to know closes, 99 ways to close. What's the best way to close, right? Because they get themselves backed into a corner at the end of an hour, end of 45 minutes, and they go, how do I take this situation that I've created and then convert, create a conversion or create a con- close, right? The close, so so you could tattoo this on your arm. The close that that real deal makers use, right? I've, I've been hundreds of transactions is this. Hey guys, looks like we're running out of time. What should we be doing here? That's a close. And stop and pause. Really important. And then pause. You're done, right? Yeah, what should yeah. we be doing together? Yeah is the only close I have. I wrote a book called Pitch Anything. Sold a million copies. And it is taught at 500 of the Fortune 500. It's taught at most major entrepreneurial universities from Yale, Harvard, Stanford, you know, MIT on down. It is, it is you know, um, the rigor uh, for Silicon Valley and Wall Street. So I wrote that book, okay? It's published in 17 countries and it's, pu- it's published in many countries where I never authorized to be published, Russia and Iran. I just had a guy go, hey, love your book. You know, thanks for publishing in Iran. I'm like my publisher doesn't publish in Iran, you know, there's sanctions, whatever. So it's published in countries we haven't even published it in. And the only close after all of that, right? After all of that love and, and a distribution of that book, the only close I have is I'm running a little short on time. What should we be doing together? So why does that close work? Because everything up to that point was done correctly. The reason people want to know closes is because they've created chaos in the mind of the buyer, you know, up to the point where time is running out. And now that they need a fancy, you know, close, like, you know, I just bought a car, you know, hey, Mr. Jones, press hard, fifth copy's yours. That is not a close, right? If I could get it to you in, if I could get it to you in frozen black, right, at the price you want, do we have a deal today? That is not a close, right? That is a, that's an emergency, you know, b- b- calling the Navy SEAL, you know, a, emergency yeah. flash Mary grenade. Thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah mm-hmm. to try and get that thing closed when nothing else was done right. So, so we go all the way. So what is the correct way to frame up a sale or presentation for money, equity, debt, whatever it is you're looking for, right? And step one, which everybody skips I don't want to hold a webinar here, but, you know, since we're talking about it and you ask is the world is changing underneath your feet and you can consider the, 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 that you've got your, both of your feet, right. As a, as a buyer or investor in on tectonic plates and those tectonic plates are moving and separating. And one is going to form Guanabana land and one is going to form the future in which you survive. Right. And so I'm going to show you how fast those tectonic plates are separating and what are the drive, you know, what are the drivers? So for example, you know, what, what is changing today? Right. Mm-hmm. So if you look at our, if you look at our economy, if you look at our you know, business environment, well, I don't know, we're converting from, you know, ice engines to electric vehicle engines, except electric vehicles are very difficult to operate and they have huge problems in it. And so there is these, these, these encampments of what is going to happen to the American automotive industry, you know, as it tries to transition to EV massive change. If you pick the wrong company like Rivian, right. 
You can invest in it at a $92 billion valuation, you know, and then lose, you know, 95% of your money, you know, a year later as the stock price sinks. We have a war in Ukraine, which is driving, you know, geopolitical changes between China, Iran, Russia. It is changing the world global market for oil. Oil itself is changing as Saudi Arabia and the Middle East is looking for, you know, different uh, sources of revenue, you know, for the years to come. China is dumping, you know, green. China is more green than anybody else to the point where they're dumping green and ruining the green markets that are establishing the United States and Switzerland. We had a global pandemic, which has changed the entire healthcare system. The healthcare in the United States is extremely expensive. Let's not forget the AI. Let's yeah, not forget AI. AI <laughs> right. AI is wiping out an entire layer of white collar workers. You know, and if you're an intern and you intended to be in an investment bank, AI is wiping out your entire position. We're going to have an entire generation of, of missing investment bankers who haven't had those couple of years of experience because banks don't need, an, you know, any need to have junior associates or, you know, or interns, you know, so I don't know what's changing. Like, so, so whatever industry you're in, there is some tectonic change that you have to frame up is saying this change is going to affect your business. Everything good. Right. Right. And I, we, can I draw my attention yeah. just for a second? The way you did it was just a masterclass itself because you use this very concrete metaphor that you're standing in these tectonic plates and they're pulling apart. And so what's happening in the audience's mind is they're envisioning, because you're using this concrete language, they're envisioning themselves dropping inside a volcano, whatever, whatever the, 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 the play break is. And that's immediately introduces your crocodile brain, I would imagine, right? To use your metaphor, kind of sort of our kind of like where things are dangerous and survival instincts are primitive parts of ourselves. And so that's the one that was like, wow, I need to pay attention to this. This is this. There's a lot at stake. So you're raising Reason, the stakes. Right. Why do you start every pitch with moving tectonic plates? Right. One is because change is the only thing that the human mind requires itself to pay attention to. Movement and change is is built into the mechanics of the human mind and it causes it to instantly stop thinking about everything else and focus on movement and change. So if you say the world is changing, you know, as I said in the book, winter is coming, right? So if you start talking to someone about dramatic weather, they will stop everything they're doing and and want to collect the information you have about the storm, about the rain, about the heat wave, about the dust storm, about the, uh, you know, um, because we are, are built to pay attention to things that are changing systemically in our environment and movement. And so that now you're not starting your pitch with some, you know, story about, you, uh, you know, the new product introductions you have or how excited you are to meet or anything like that. I just, you know, I'll, I will start with, you know, hey, Alex, you're ready to go for that uh, 10 o'clock meeting. It's like it's, we're crashing through 10.05. If you don't have anything else to do, why don't we get rolling? So look, one of the reasons that I, you know, I'm so, you know, want to be so direct with you is we are experiencing such a dramatic change in the finance industry, you know, as, you know, as the, the, we have moved so aggressively out of an interest rate environment mm -hmm. into, you know, what used to be, you know, really high mezzanine where basic funding is now 10, 12, 14%. So we moved from the everything bubble in which you could buy anything flip it up to a ready buyer on the other side mm -hmm. to a high interest rate environment so dramatically in which there are no buyers on the other side. And we have a good portion of our industry who are locked into assets that have mm -hmm. not yet repriced. And when those right. assets repriced, right, you are going to see the, you know, the Warren Buffett proverbial tide go out and see, you know, who's not wearing any underwear. Okay. So the, what we're here today to decide is, you know, what will the value and the liquidity of your assets be as this interest rate environment continues for the next six months? Now, look, I looked at your assets. You know, we look at the portfolio there. You know, it's relatively public. I see the problem you have. As the market shifts, Alex, it, you know, in my opinion, you have this problem so bad that if you let it get any worse, even we would not want this account and work on it. So I'm going to I'm going to lay out for you what we believe is going to be happening. Yeah. over the next six to eight months, right? And you and you will say, hey, Oren, I believe in that vision or I don't believe in that vision. Right. Right, I cannot work on your business harder than you will. 
So if you see this change affecting you in the same way that we do, we would have a lot to work on together. And then we should spend our, you know, the next 20 minutes figuring out a solution, right? How to take everything we know how to do, all the experience we have, you know, our people, our, our IP, you know, our, our investor base and put all of that to work alongside you, right? Or we say, hail fellow well met, no idea how we work together. And we each go back to the coal mine and do the work we were doing before. But let's spend like five minutes figuring that out. Sound good? So, so now you see we have change, we have status, we have expertise, and we have a fork in the road. Yogi Berra said, you know, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. And well, actually, so I want to I want to draw two two things that kind of stood out at, uh, for me, and like the, the, we're taking this perspective from our podcast's audience, right? And what we care about is this shift, kind of tectonic shift between me centric communications and me centric experiences and yeah. customer centric. And what you've done very much up front, right, was your language and the way you framed the initial reason why we're together you didn't go like oh look at our products we were founded in 2000 blah blah like we have this many offices that much maybe that's somewhere in the background right like the like as a status thing but you went into the customer centric language of what's in it for for the customer from this meeting so like loud and clear hair kind of hair raising like a little shiver oh my god this is this is important i need to pay attention to this right and then, so I think, I think that's yeah, right. did I get yeah. that right or 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 like? Well, here, let me let me box it up for you, right? I, I I try and do this. Hey, Alex, I've got a box here with everything that you need in it. Yeah, the IP, the software, the financial strategy, the spreadsheets, the people that execute it, push button, snap in, would snap you into that, right? Everything in this box solved your problem, but before I show you what's in the box, right? And exactly how we would do this, I need to know some things about you because I'm not yeah. willing to work on your business harder than you are. And we're pretty yeah. choosy about who we work with. So, so what's there is correct. You, once you tell people what's in your magic box, it had to be a magic box, your box. Once, right, once you tell people what your product is, that meeting is over. Why do yeah. I need to sit around and learn more now I know the product, right? My next question is what? How much is it, right? And how fast does it take to get me the value or the benefit? What is the traction maybe right? or whatever if it's investor? Right. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And then I go, sounds good. Send me a proposal or send me the deck and I hit pause. And you are now elf on a shelf sitting there. And what do I do? I go look for other deals or if it's a product, you know, or a value proposition driven thing, I go look for a, a cheaper one from China. So this, so in my presentations, you will not, I have raised money before I want to, you know, well, let me get, you know, without really showing people what the company does until they've committed to invest. I'd let that sink in. Right. And that, I, one of the I, reasons why you did that is you gave, you had the status, but you also framed it as a, must have solution without going into details for what the solution is effectively. Is that accurate? So, so correct. So I have a company, I have yeah. a portfolio company that I'm funding right now. The, what the company makes goes in every single American home. Domestically, it's a $21 billion market. Every American home needs one of these. It's between $5,000 to $25,000. You could easily put $160,000 of this product in a 5,000 square foot home, right? But that every, every single American home needs this and has it. Otherwise, you know, you live in a trailer that isn't fully built. There is one company in the world that makes the equipment that makes this product. 70% of this product has to be imported from India, China, Vietnam, Malaysia, Spain and Israel, because there is not enough manufacturing capacity here in the US to make these products for American homes. Not only that, all of this product that comes from India, China, Vietnam, Malaysia, Spain, Israel is toxic 
to American workers. Mm. So now you have something that is going into every American home inside your home. You use it right now. Um, it is the menu, the, the production of it for your home was toxic to American workers, gives them lung cancer. It, most of it has to be imported because we don't have enough domestic manufacturing of it. And one company controls the entire world's supply of this product. And so that's the company I'm working on. We're, you know, so that's the company that you're pitching is the company that controls the supply or the company that partner. will be competing. They have a new, they have a new, yeah. they have a yeah. new machine that can now make it in the United States with raw was material was out, was, was, was first the in the United city. States yeah. without being toxic to American yeah. workers. If you're interested in doing this with me, just give me a dollar amount, you know, that would be comfortable. Yeah. If I think, you know, that's a good amount, then we'll, you will go in the meeting. I'll tell you what the product is, where it sits in your home, and how we make money doing it. Yeah, that's brilliant. So I, th I think you've you've set up the the it, it it's intrigue, and this is part of what I think you describe as an intrigue frame, and then yes. people are like, yeah, so "What the hell frame. is this?" Like everybody here that's listening to this, I want to know what this product is, right? Like you know, this sounds right. incredible. I mean, give uh, me a number. Yeah, give yeah. me a number that you're you're in. You know, I'm like it's not a binding commitment. I'm not going to ask yeah. you to send me any money, yeah. but you know, give me a number that you'd be if, if all of this was true, and we could build yeah. a billion dollar asset in 36 yeah. months, doing this right and make you know and make 60 percent uh, gross margins, 40 percent net margins. In essence, you could make a 4x on your money in 36 months doing yeah. this non toxic domestically with an Italian company, new technology, replacing Chinese and Indian product. And you could turn your, your potentially turn your hundred thousand dollars into 400,000, right? 36 months or less alongside me you know, with me running the company. What's the number that you would be, you know, comfortable right. putting in for that kind of return? And then well, you I'm actually sure make people, here. you make people put in the yeah, number. Give me your right? number. Like, yeah. Give me your well, number. Just give me a number. We, I'm, I'm all in relate to man. I'm sorry. Or I'm, 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 I'm a one, one trick pony. But I think the relative for me is the one company that can be inside every every knowledge worker's toolkit. And we're yeah. the only ones that are doing it from PDFs and presentations. So for me, what you just described, it actually opened up a whole new way of thinking of how we so present it. I, if, but I will tell I you was, something. Can yeah. I can I if I was to do it for you, yeah. if yeah. I was to do it for you, right? I would say, listen, I think we in the United States content you know business content has with ai has jumped the shark or tipped to having zero integrity in its current packaging right so un once you've seen three four five presentations documents products made by ai you no longer trust single point documents to be you know valuable Right. Because you can clearly see the, the fingerprints of AI all over it. And so, you know, you know, that that the that they, you know, it, it was made from three year, three year old Wikipedia. Right. And, you know, the value of that content is near zero because it doesn't have human current human insight in it. Right. So with the value of content going to zero. Right. The only thing that is going to have uh, you know, a value for business consumers going forward is, co is context, mm -hmm. right? So it's documents organized together that feed each other, that were made by humans, organized by humans that have context, right? And so, so what I would do is I would reframe single point documents as having zero value in the current generation of business. And then I would start to build you know, examples of that being true and then I would say the question is, and I would ask an authentic question. The question is, how do you give a business user enough context so you know the information that he's getting actually has value to his business and was not you know, pre-assembled IKEA style by AI? And the answer to that question is fundamental to how much revenue growth you'll have in your business over the next three years. And that's it. So now I don't have to say anything about relate to. Right. Going into it, I get to, you know, I get to reframe all other modes of business content as irrelevant. Right. And then, then I get to say, you know, where do you want to take your business? 
you know, where, you know, where do you want to take your business over the next three years? And, you know, like, I mean, you know, I don't have enough data to make this pitch, but that's how I would start to very prescient, very prescient. Yeah. Build into it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think the, and we, 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 we worry between enabling the, the creator and creating the context for the consumer. So we bring in the magic is actually in having both, right? Like, cause changing behaviors is hard for sellers and for marketers and also the, the, what you're talking about, the context, but it's, it's what you've done is brilliant. And what I like having thought about this pitch, like I, I did not, you know, some, some points resonate obviously around, you know, zero cost of content, but the, the framing is interesting lever that, you know, I mean, for I, me, I normally if I, would if, not... I a, if I had the platform, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I would I would show like how multiple content technologies, yeah, like, have just you know sort of gone in that this is Sparta pit, you know, and just been kicked <laughs> in the pit, and they're in the bottom, right? Yeah. Because the the value of content that doesn't have that isn't on a platform, yeah. and that doesn't have a you know a, a credentialed creator yeah. vouching for it is zero yeah. yeah yeah and until right and, and and so if i was pitching this i would say hey alex until you tell me a we need that context for our content and b we know how to attach a creator's cr you know credibility to our content until you tell me those two things i'm not going to show you the platform because i'm not going to give you religion right if you believe yeah. You can stick your stuff into AI, right? Have AI produce content, and you can throw that content in a Dropbox and send it to someone. And yeah. they have high trust, high believability, high believability, and want to do business with you. If that's your belief system, I'm out. Yeah. Things are moving way too fast in this area, and we are way too busy for me to have to give you religion. Well, you're just you killing, say, by, the, by the way, right now, you're just killing the entire SEO industry right here, right now. You're just like, you're just annihilating them and the parallel thing, because that has already been like, uh, like a travesty to some degree where, where it was optimized. It was the kind of done for the, for the algorithms and not for humans. And yeah. what you're, uh, you know, now yeah. with AI, it's just going to get worse. Um, so great. So and, I think that's, then, a, that's a great yeah. example. You say, I mean. So, so the other thing that I like to do, yeah. right, is in these frameworks is to show over time how the same thing has happened repeatedly. No. All right. So, for example, let's pick some industries that I know nothing about. Uh, but, but so, so I'll give you in the theater industry. Hmm. You've seen this happen a couple times, right? Way back when you probably need someone, but films are silent, right? Because they couldn't figure the audio out. Then somebody goes, Dolby or whoever goes, hey, I figured stereo audio out and the films are not silent. That wiped out every single director, every single actor, every single writer from the silent era, right? They, those guys were immediately unemployed and a whole new era. So, you know, film went through a couple of generations. But the thing that you would be most familiar with in the theater industry is when stadium seating was introduced. In a period mm. of one year, Stadium seating wiped out the entire, you know, uh, you know, regular seating theater, but completely wiped it out financially, right? Because the the you know obviously stadium seating you can see above the person in front of you, and flat seating you can't, right? And it was a if you didn't have stadium seating, you could not run a profitable theater within one year of introduction of that product. Um, you know, then. But, you know, you saw something else happen in, you know, in the theater business. So it, it, you start to see the cycle happen over and over again. We had the pandemic. Nobody went to theater. So they never go to a theater again. And all the content providers then started pushing the content to the distribution, to the uh, distribute the, you know, online channels. So now you could right. see Thor, Renegar, you could, you know, whatever it is you wanted to see major movie release, you know, within days or even before, uh, you know, only like Mission Impossible was the only holdout. Right. So the th now... So now we've built a pattern of change in the theater industry. Yeah. And now for the fifth time in 25 years, that entire market is going through another change, right? So if you can build a pattern of change in your market, you know, as you, as you were doing, so, you know, hey, we went from printed documents to being online, 1999, completely wiped out Xerox, 
right? You know what Xerox does today? Not me either, right? So who cares, right? Nobody. I mean, I don't even think they care over Xerox, right? Then, you know, from 1999 to, you know, 2008, it was RIM and BlackBerry and everything like that, you know, and then content moved to, you know, obviously the, you know, iPhone and then Dropbox, right? And now we're seeing content in 2010 was completely transformed by, you know, whatever. And today it's going through its fifth generational change in which everything before it, you know, is getting, you know, my spaced, you know, rimmed, Xeroxed, right? And so the, the, what we're making the transition into this fifth generation of content. Brilliant. So you're, you're, it's, you're, it's a movement. It's a movement. It continues to build up the tension, right? And then your people are just bursting to release. But what's interesting, what you did, I thought it was brilliant. And I think it's really important for people to understand what you've done is you've created a, you time bounded this, right? And, and so people didn't feel like, oh my God, this is going to be another 30 minute Zoom, 30 minute Zoom right? That's going to kill me, right? And like, blah, blah. And it's not going to be a monologue. So I know I'll have time to participate, right? And you're making me make the decisions. You're making me move towards you, not the other way around. You're not shoving stuff in me, right? You're making me move towards you. And then I feel committed to that move, but you're giving me the choice. And I think this is the failure of most B2B and complex market. You're giving me some choice, not too much, right? But what I'm trying to do if you can provide insight, structural insight about somebody's own industry. Yeah. Right. If you can provide true insight where they go, I had never thought about it like that. I never thought about the med tech industry, fintech industry, content industry, SEO industry, you know, automotive industry in that, in that structural organization before that. So, that per now you're not pitching that person. That person wants to spend time with you. And more mm. importantly, they want to introduce you to other people in their organization. Like, hey man, you got to listen to what Alex is. Like this, can you do that again? I've had multiple. So so I've had, you know, directors to companies go, can you do that again? I'm like, what? Like my pitch? Yeah, sure. They're like, hold on. I want to get Tom, Susan, and Harry, right? And Right? On it. I'm, okay, I'm going to go, okay, great. They're like, yeah, I want you to show, you know, our senior directors that same thing. You remember everything you just said? I'm like, yeah, that's like what I do, right? You know, or or I've had, you know, in a negotiation, I've had people, you know, applaud, right? So, you know, give my presentation with like, hey, this is my view on how your industry is organized. And they'll be like, my God, that's amazing. And then I had the, the, the chairman of the company go, we don't applaud our vendors, right? We negotiate against them. They're like, no, that was great. It was amazing. So if you can help somebody organize their thinking about their own industry structurally and paint for them clearly what's going to happen next and tie into either what they believe or help advance their thinking to see around the corner, then the, the, you don't have to close. Their desire to work with you will be, you know, they will say, how do we work with you before you finished your, you know, pitch or the meeting? When, if you think back to the times, the people mm. have said, hey, Alex, how do we work with you? Right? It is because you have given them such certainty mm. that you know how to manage their uncertainty. The things that are most frustrating to them, they, 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 you've given them certainty that you can, you have experience in a domain where they feel like they will fail without an expert guiding them. And they just go, hey, Alex, how do we work with you? Like, you stop. I, I don't need the benefits, value proposition, logos. Just what, what, what's next steps? And when people say that, it's because you've given them certainty. Well, you're creating value, right? You're also just creating value because you're interpreting the world. Well, I want to uh, be careful. I want to yeah. be careful for all the young people listening here yeah. Yeah. about creating value because they think you have to give value. The value is you, your experience, and your ability to solve these problems. What everybody right. tries to do is they try and deliver value. You are the value. So the, you're not, it's not about, you, I, here's what I do. I am, I'm the prize. What you're saying is you need to I'm be the, the prize. Yeah. Listen, man, I don't know how you got this problem so bad, right? But again, yeah. if it gets any worse, even I'm not going to work on it, right? Mm. And it's my job yeah. to, you know,
you know, yeah. sell and win this business. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm a good salesperson. This customer you know. experience is so horrible. Even a relator can't help you was the was the this thing type of thing, right? Like that's yeah, if this gets any know, worse. If, if it, like, yeah, got it. Mm. We, if this gets we're busy, if this gets any worse, we we just would not want to no. do any work on it with our, you know, it's just a lot of work. Like, can we solve it? Sure. Right. But do I want to take like five guys off, put two engineers on it, work on it myself, you know, spend 30 days fixing the problem that you don't. like, I don't own any equity in your company. I don't yeah. have any stock. I don't have any upside. Right. So for me to take, you know, 80 of my hours, five of my engineers and fix your problems makes no sense. Right. You're yeah. just about at that tipping point where even we wouldn't touch it. Yeah. So, so you, you're continuing to create, so you create, you know, you, your, you, you create your environment, your frame, and then you're pu pushing back a little bit and you create again, more, more insight from your frame and then you're pulling back. And so they're drawn right. to you and That's you're never really like going for the close the way the traditional 500 sales training setups are like, like where you're kind of just doing this slow cheesy techniques. Everybody can see 10 miles away. And you're just focusing, actually, you are focusing on the narrative and the content and how it's delivered. Now, Oren, one thing that we find really interesting is, and, and I want to be conscious of, of time here before you call it out. Well, but one of the things... Something again, yeah. Yeah, we should do it again. But one thing that we'd like to come back to is how, do, how, how is this done in a digital environment? when you're not in the room because your time is valuable. And so how do you clone Oren, right? And have this, t this type of conversational experience where people are pulling in. That's a fundamentally fascinating problem for us. And I, you know, couldn't dream of a better thought partner on this. And I think this is something that's going to be really relevant to our audience. You know, how can they take your framework, right? Which is brilliant. You know, we all kind of, every, every, everybody who's listened to this gets it, I oh. think, and then scale so it. I do this, right? I'm saying, hey, look, I've got some ideas that I want to share with you, right? For example, about, you know, in, in our business about finance, yeah, right? And, and I just say, in my experience, someone like you who's looking to make, you know, we, we help people, you know, invest in deals, you know, and make a return on money. But someone like you who's looking for ways to invest, you know, has two windows on the world. One is get rich crazy, and the other is get rich slow, right? And if you're sort of cresting through 30, 40, you know, maybe even 50, and you haven't got that like $10 million set, set aside, the problem is you gravitate, get rich slow, which is, you know, mutual funds, core index funds, you know, core real estate, you know, stuff that your wealth manager is, is not going to get you there, right? Un unless, you know, you'll, you will run out of time before you have enough money to retire on. So what happens is, you gravitate to stuff that is get rich crazy, right? Whether that is Bitcoin, whether that is, you know, CBD manufacturing, whether that is mining copper on asteroids, whether that's AI, electric vehicles, battery, chip, you know, new kinds of AI chips, you know, whatever, whatever in Dubai, flipping real estate and right. So, you know, raising a fund, you stick your nose and stuff. You have no business sticking it in, right? In, in the attempt to hundred extra money quickly, right? And that doesn't work. You know why it doesn't work? Because professionals who have money, have PhDs, have organizations do it, can't do it. So how are you sitting in your house, you know, with your laptop going to sort of, you know, 100x your money in a very short period of time, you know, with Ty Lopez or whatever. So that's not going to happen. So in the middle is something that real investors do that is between, you know, make money slowly in the stock market and get rich crazy investing in new technologies that are have a one in... 3 million chance of getting beyond, you know, off the, off the laptop, you know, getting any real customers. And so that is called a 4X in 18 to 36 months. Who does that? Every single family that has made 10, 20, 30, 50, a hundred million dollars. They're not trying to get rich crazy and they're not, you know, they certainly have money in the markets, you know, just slow, but they're looking for these 4X deals. And these 4X deals have very particular elements to them. Right. I've organized that into what I call just a royal flush. Five simple cards. Ace of spades, king of spades, queen of spades, jack of spades, ten of spades. And you can just go, hey, I, if you see those five cards that every family office uses and how they play them, then you can also play those same cards and start looking 
for these same forex opportunities because if you can take 100,000 forex at 400,000 you know forex set again you know be 1.6 million then you'd be up in 6 million and then you have an easy chance to so if you could do that over and over again the way people do every day then you would be satisfying your need to you know increase your nest egg the ability where you have enough money to do whatever you want or retire in safety and so so come check out this little presentation that I have on how to do that right if you love that We'll figure out what to do next with each other. It's on Thursday at 10 o'clock. You know, you can jump in. And, and so that's how I do it, Alex, you know, exactly. And then people jump in that presentation. That can be recorded. That can be live. And, and then at the end, you just go, listen, if this is for you, let's talk one-on-one, -on -one, right? Got and it. make it happen. So that, it. that is how you scale using intrigue, insight, you know, value. But you, you have to take people... You, you have to show them you have some insight to their choices right now, that those choices are getting, you know, they got a foot on, on, you know, this tectonic, this tectonic, and they're spreading, you know, and they're just going to plunk into the middle without, you know, some additional knowledge and experience and someone who knows what they're doing. And so that's how I would scale that. This is brilliant. Oren, I enjoyed it so much. Thank you for digging in. For everyone, Oren it runs Intersection Capital. We're going to take the nuggets from this episode. We're going to take the links to that webinar that you want to you know, share with the audience, Oren, and put it together in a pod book so that you guys could take this and digest it because there's so much richness here. I know I'll go back to this episode, especially the relate to freebie advice. Thanks. Thanks, Oren. That was great. But I think anybody, anybody who is not Goldman Sachs, walking into a deal that's tidy up for you and you have to work for it. You know, Oren has just shared with us an amazing proven playbook of how to equalize your status, create an amazing excitement for the users that it's a life and death situation for them to pay attention, not force them so you don't have to feel bad about being salesy anymore. You know, you're actually, you know, cre cre showed showed the value i this is like this is every startup every entrepreneur everybody who's a, a small team that ha, dreams big should be doing this oren you know if i type oren in the internet it'll bring me to you we'll provide yeah, the pod book. anything else you want to share with our audience any last words no so. i think i think it's good i think you know if, if you like this stuff you know obviously work with you know Rail 2 and the way it, you know, the contact experience platform, I'm very impressed by it. Like literally, I mean, this is nice. Alex, I know Alex here, he was kind enough to put him, but like I use the platform and I love it. I think it, it sat, that's why I was able to talk about it in this way. I think it satisfies the needs going forward for people to see video documents in context from a, a trusted source. So I like it. I recommend you use it. If you want to hear, you know, more stuff that I have, you should go to orenclaff.com. You can sign up and I put out an email, you know, a couple times a week on this stuff. And so that's how we could interact. So those, that's it. But I, I really enjoyed talking to you today. Love it, Oren. Thank you so much. And everybody, Thanks, you Alex. will listen to the episode more than once. I promise you. Thank you.